Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk. Today's topic is Create Training Plans and Content for Your Finance and Operations Project Series, Part 3, The Content Development Plan. My name is Nina, and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this web conference through Teams Live Events, and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. By participating in this session using Microsoft Teams, your name, email address, phone number, and or title may be viewable by other session participants. If you do not consent to being a part of a recorded session, please disconnect at this time. To turn on closed captioning for this event, click on the gear icon found in the lower right-hand corner of the video pane. From the pop-up menu, click on cap captions, subtitles, and select your language from the options that appear in the drop-down menu. If you have any questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions during and after the event. The recording of this presentation will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Now onto the presentation. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Rachel Profit, Senior Program Manager. Rachel, over to you. Thanks, Nina. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as usual, I am super excited to be here and sharing with you all today about the um, content development plan. So this kind of brings us full circle in our series. Um, again, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel Profit. My contact information is here on the slide. I encourage you to reach out if you do have questions. Um, follow me on Twitter at Rachel Profit. You can connect with me on LinkedIn or follow my blog at Dynamic mix365lady.com. So in the third and final part of our series, we're really going to be focusing on the content de development plan. So we're going to start out by talking about what are those different components and when you should be creating that plan. And then we're going to switch gears and talk about the um, eight adult learning principles and all of these factors that are going to contribute to having successful content um, and a good learning environment for your employees. We'll also talk about how to um, measure success in your content and training plan and then we'll review some tips and tricks for creating technically accurate and engaging content. We'll also talk about some tools and resources that are available for helping you get your content development started with finance and operation apps. So with that let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, you might recall this slide from our um, you know previous sessions and really where we're at in this journey and what I'm focusing in on today is that develop training materials. So um, you know in the first part we really talked about kind of managing that change and how to um, involve the the user and then we started kind of building that foundation and, and talking about creating that communication plan in part two and today we're really going to focus in on how to actually develop all of this content. So when we think about a um, good content de development plan, it's going to answer all of these questions that you see here. The exact format that you use um, to answer these questions is less important, um, but, but I will be sharing an example a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, so you'll need to think about what content needs to be developed and in what format, who's going to develop and review this content, how will you be measuring success, how long will it take to develop this content, and when is this content needed by, and where are we going to be storing all of this content, and how are we going to distribute this out to the users. So diving into each one of these questions, I've put together some additional information. So when you're determining what content needs to be developed, there are two key inputs that you will need to gather. The course inventory, um, which comes from your actual training plan, and that's the list of what courses need to be delivered. And then your content inventory. So this is going to come from your library of content, um, and this is what you already have. So you might have current business processes, test scripts, task recordings, um, standard operating procedures, business requirement documents, FDDs, um, and so on, right? That list of your inventory might be slightly different but those are oftentimes a good starting point. If you have to start from a blank piece of paper, that's okay too, and in some courses or some content you might need to, but you're still going to want to take inventory of what you already have and can be reused. 
you're also going to need um, to think about, you know, what those details are for each artifact. And so there's some examples listed out here on the slide. Once you know what you already have, then you can create a gap list of content that needs to be developed or in some cases maybe just updated, um, you know, with new screenshots of the new version of the software. Um, you'll likely need a variety of different artifacts, so the likelihood that a, a particular course will only need one artifact, um, one, you know, PowerPoint or one um, handout or something like that is unlikely. Um, so you'll need to consider that as you're developing each course and consider the format of the course when you're creating your gap list of content. So if you're planning to do in um, uh, self-paced learning, but all you have today are you know, some PowerPoints and some standard operating procedures in a Word document, then we're going to have to create videos to go along with that to make a self-paced learning course. Because um, you likely don't want just straight up text that someone has to read in a self-paced learning course. Um, and you'll also want to consider each artifact. So if a particular course needs a syllabus, um, a PowerPoint and a handout, then in your content development plan, you're going to have three rows. So for each course and each artifact, you'll need to decide what format will be used. Um, you'll want to make sure that you consider that you may need more multiple formats or artifacts for a single course to meet the requirements of a broader audience. That was a big part of why when we made our training plan, we were identifying the who of our training um, audience, right? Who are we going to be training? Um, because if I need to make my training content in both English and Spanish, then I'm going to have to duplicate each of my artifacts in each language. Um, you'll also want to consider the volume of users. A higher volume may require more flexibility in your format, while lower volumes may only need one resource or type of artifact. You also want to think about the turnover of the users in each role for the, the courses that you're planning to develop. And you'll need to consider the length of time needed for the course. Creating a self-paced course for something that's 20 hours of content may not be the best option. Um, it might be better to make something that is a, a hybrid of instructor-led and self-paced. Um, content. So you'll need to think about that because making 20 hours of videos and forcing someone to sit through 20 hours of videos could become boring and not very engaging after the first, you know, two hours of videos. And you'll want to be sure to document all the details that you gather in your course syllabus and agenda. So one thing that you shouldn't skimp on and you never skip on any course is every course should always have a syllabus and agenda. And remember that all of these documents and things that you're putting together are living documents. They will continue to evolve and mature over time throughout your project. And when you do the first pass, you might be missing certain details. And that's okay, as long as you know that you need to gather those details and you have a plan in place to do so. So next, you'll need to determine who will develop this content. Um, you'll want to start by identifying who your SMEs, your, your subject matter experts are, and your business process owners, and be sure to consider their project load and availability. If you know they're assigned to this project and they're expected to be putting 40 hours a week into system configuration and testing, adding you know, more work and more content development on top of them may not be the best idea um, for that particular person. So consider if you can reshuffle duties in the team or if you need to bring more people into the project. It's also important to consider the content development and technical writing skills of your staff. Again, like we talked about, you know, that train the trainer approach in our last session, while some people might be fantastic at using the system, they may not um, have the, the content development or writing skills um, that are really required to, to make really great content. Um, 
so you'll need to think about that um, as you're selecting people that will be helping to develop content. And it's okay if you're limited on resources, just consider if they don't have strong writing skills, you may need to uh, use someone else to help review that content. But I always recommend that you play to the strengths of each of your team members and to pick the best resource for each job and each task at hand. There's likely someone on the team who enjoys these types of, of tasks and it is one of their strengths and other people that maybe don't prefer to write and would rather review or maybe record videos. So think about that and, and pull your employees, ask them, you know, what makes sense. So the next thing that you'll need to think about is who will review the content. It is important that you involved the correct business process owners, managers, SMEs, and so on. Um, and you may also want to have HR review content for larger audiences um, as well to ensure scalability to your entire organization. Um, the skill set of the people that you identify to review is important as well. Don't select someone who is good at the old process but has never seen the new process. Um, you may also want to consider using multiple reviewers to get diverse perspectives on your content. Um, again, you know, I, I did a reference to this in part one as well uh, to the, the movie Field of Dreams. Um, regarding the building of your content and the adoption of your solution. Uh, the same principle applies to your content and delivery of that content. Just because you make really good content does not imply that your users will have the knowledge that they need to be successful at their jobs or performing specific actions in the system. And this is why creating good objectives and having a plan to measure those objectives is critical to the success of your rollout. So that takes us into our next, um, you know, component of your content development plan. How are you going to be measuring success? Um, and this should directly tie back to the objectives that you outlined in your training plan. If you set out with an objective such as create a new sales order, then your attendees really ought to be able to create a new sales order at the end of the training. Make sure that you plan and include details about how you might quiz or test the knowledge of participants at the end of the course or throughout the course. Um, your course might also include hands-on components. And if you're including hands-on components, you want to make sure they're documented clearly. Um, and if there's going to be measurements of those hand-on components, what are those measure measurements as well? So for example, you might provide participants with a task and give them a set amount of time to complete those tasks. Then someone might log on to the system to validate that the task is completed in the time allotted at the end of the exercise. But you're going to need to plan for that as well because you need someone to basically be air, air quote, grading the work that the the participants did. Next, um, you know, is figuring out how long it'll take to develop content. It's super easy to underestimate the amount of time it will take. Um, and this process is often started too late in a project, which leaves you cutting corners and skipping steps to get something or anything out the door just before your go live. If you create a good list of content in each artifact to be developed, it will be easier to estimate the amount of time required. So for example, when you initially start your plan, you might use a rough rule, like for each one hour of content, you estimate 10 hours of content development time. Um, once you have the full list of artifacts, it might be easier to estimate the amount of time for each artifact. So for example, syllabus and agendas are going to be one hour a piece and a review for a syllabus and agenda will take half an hour. A 10 page user guide is going to take two hours and to review a 10 page user guide will take half an hour. A 30, uh, 30 slides for a PowerPoint will take two hours and reviewing those slides will take another half hour and then you can add all of that up giving you a total of six and a half hours for that particular course. 
When you break each component or artifact down with the steps, it will be much easier to estimate. And if you use Excel, you can create formulas to estimate the time based on inputs that you enter for each artifact. So the last um, component here, um, well, not the last one, but um, is when is this content going to be required? Um, when you're creating your plan, you need to get definitive deadlines for each task in the plan. I like to work backwards from the content delivery date to use a just-in-time approach for the content development. Just like we're using a just-in-time approach or we recommend using a just-in-time approach for the delivery, the development of the content also tends to work very well when you use a just-in-time approach because um, certain aspects like security may not be in place, development may not be done, and if we wait as long as we can, um, but we're still planning and allowing enough time um, in the plan to get those content development done, it will make that whole process easier. You'll need to also consider if there's any publishing or printing lead times along with shipping for physically printed content. So um, if you've got a bunch of warehouses and you're going to be shipping participant guides that are printed um, or handouts for the classroom, um, consider how are you going to handle that printing? Are you going to send these files to administrators at each warehouse and they're going to print them? Um, you know, how much time is that going to take? Um, if you've got thousands of pages to print, it might take a good amount of time and that might pull that administrator, you know, away from their day to day job. If you're going to use an outsource company to print your materials, consider what how much lead time they need, what those costs are, and if they're going to be shipping it to a location, what's the shipping lead time? Um, it, having to overnight, you know, large amounts of paper can be very expensive because paper is heavy. Um, I can testify to that because I've had to do that in the past. So think about it. Make sure you're planning for it. Next up is where are you going to store all of this content? And before you start like going nuts creating content, you want to make sure that you have a good content management plan in place. Um, so you're likely to have a lot of different people working on this. You're going to want to think about a versioning strategy, strategy. Are multiple people going to be working and editing the same content or the same files at the same time? And what collaboration tools will you use to collaborate with other team members and communicate when a, re a review is ready or completed for a particular artifact? You'll need to know where content will be stored and maintained while it's being created and in a draft mode. And this is oftentimes a different place than the public repository. You might organize your internal development repository differently than you do your public repository. So you'll need to think about that folder structure that you want to use both internally and publicly for your users to consume it. And when you think about the public repository, you'll want to consider how will users access this content? From what types of devices will they be accessing this content? Um, you may also need special security setup for your repository to ensure that the wrong people don't have access to the content. You probably don't want everyone seeing all of your payroll um, you know, user guides and exactly how you process your payroll. Um, that's really only appropriate for the payroll department. Um, and also it can be confusing to users if they see a lot of content or details out there that aren't relevant to their job or their role. So you'll need to think about that security of your content. Then you're going to finally figure out how are you going to distribute this content? You've developed it all. Um, how are you going to distribute this out to your users? So you want to make sure to gather and document who the audience is for each one of your artifacts. If you documented well in your training plan, you don't really need to kind of do a lot of extra work because it's already in the training plan and will follow suit with the content development plan. However, if you have um, content that's in multiple languages, you want to make sure that you're tracking what language each person will need um, if they're Spanish speaking or English speaking, for example. 
Um, you'll also need a communication plan to let your users know where this content is, how to register for your live and online courses, and any system or security requirements. If they're going to be logging into an LMS system or a new SharePoint site, consider that you might actually need to train them how to use and access these new systems that you might be deploying out to your users. Um, you might also want to consider if you're using a learning management system or a SharePoint site or something like that, who has access to upload courses? Who can view each course? Are you planning to assign courses to users um, or content to specific users um, and just allow them to get to relevant content or are you going to keep it open and they can see everything? So I've put together a sample content development plan and instead of spending a bunch of time on the screenshot here, I'm just going to go ahead and switch over to our demo and show you the sample content development plan. So um, this content development plan has VLOOKUPs that link to the actual training plan. So it's important if you want to use this um, and the formulas that are in here uh, for like the course name and the course length as an example, they actually look up to the content of, uh, to the training plan, which is the spreadsheet that we looked at in part two. Um, so the idea here is that you'll make a list of each of those artifacts. Again, I recommend that you number these. I'm just using a simple you know, numbering sequence here, but you can be more intelligent with your numbering uh, if you wanted to as well. So you can see that course one here has two artifacts, um, course two has two artifacts, and course three has two artifacts. The idea here is that you would indicate what format this is and then describe the artifact. One of the things that you'll want for every single course no matter what is a syllabus and agenda, um, but you might need additional things. The type, um, I created this as a drop down box so you can indicate obviously you can add more types to this as well if you're get getting creative, um, but PowerPoint, syllabus and agenda, participant guides, hands on labs, quizzes, videos and documents are the key types of artifacts that you may, might be developing. And so um, the course length will help you indicate, you know, how long is this course? And then you can estimate the number of pages and the number of minutes. So you may not fill in both of these for every type of artifact. So if you're making a quick reference guide, so for example, if I wanted to do a quick reference guide for this course, I would probably want to describe it a little bit further than this, you know, for creating a sales order because um, I might have multiple quick reference guides. So in my type, I would select that this is a document and then in my estimated pages, it's just a two page document. Uh, you might then use formulas, which I have done in the um, sample here. I'm using the estimated number of pages um, and the estimated number of minutes to um, create a formula here to automatically figure out how long. You can obviously adjust those formulas, um, but it, it allows us to kind of automatically figure out how much time do we think we're going to need to develop all of this content. And then I've got columns where you can actually update and track the actual development time. And this will allow you to tweak your plan, right? Because if you notice that you were estimating a half hour per page, page, um, but it's really only taking, you know, 15 minutes per page. You might want to adjust that formula after you've got some actual data. You'll also want to keep track of who the content owner, developer, and reviewers are. And then I've got a due date and a status column to allow you to keep track of that and then some notes as well. It's, it's not uncommon that there might be things going on that you want to just keep some notes or comments about your courses. So the idea here is that you make a list of every single type of content that you need to create um, and use this as your plan um, to assign out to the different people who needs to work on what. So with that, we're going to switch back to the slides and uh, switch gears a little bit to talk about the eight principles of adult learning. So before you start putting pen to paper, it's important to consider the audience of your content and consider the eight basic principles of adult learning. And these eight principles will help guide you when developing your content. So we're going to take a look at each one of these. 
So the first one, adults are autonomous and self-directing, meaning that they live under a large degree of self-governance and to their own laws, beliefs, and values. They need to know the benefits, the values, and the purposes of a learning program, and they need to know why they are learning what they're learning. If they cannot appreciate the purpose or the value, they're going to be reluctant to engage in the learning intervention. Um, so, you know, some things that you can do, explain those benefits, make it clear and relatable objectives, and pull your audience. And always be ready to adjust. Remember that this is a living document and you're going to have to kind of keep adjusting as your workforce ages and you bring new younger people in, their expectations are going to be much more different than the aging workforce in your organization. The next um, principle is that adults learn through direct experience. Therefore, their training and learning interventions must include active and practical participation and offer implementable techniques and methodologies that they will uh, immediately use to help improve their everyday lives. Now, uh, you know, Dynamics 365 is probably not improving the everyday life of every user in the system, but they need to see what the benefit is to them. So you might have to put your kind of sales and marketing cap on to think about how will this benefit the role and the audience that um, is using this particular portion of the system. Next up, uh, content must be meaningful and relevant. So the content of your training program has to be meaningful and relevant to the adult learners, their lives, and your business. So they must very clearly see why and how it's important to them personally and how it applies to their life or how it applies to their job. The immediate use of the learning needs to be clearly understood by the learner. If they can't see how they can personally apply the learning to their own life and their own role in their day-to-day -day job, um, it's suggested that motivation towards the training um, will be significantly reduced. So think about, um, you know, why is this important to me? And how can you answer that question in your objectives and in your content and in your communication plan? Adult learners need to be able to draw upon their past experiences to aid in their learning. So training needs to be contextualized to use a language that they're familiar with. And I'm not just talking about English versus Spanish type of language. Um, it's very common that organizations over time kind of come up with their own language, their own speak. You come up with a lot of jargon um, and things like that that you're used to from the old system. And when you're implementing a new system, oftentimes there's new terminology that comes into play. And so kind of translating, you know, what they used to call it to what it's now going to be called is sometimes essential. Um, and it might seem very basic, but um, think about the language that, you know, people are familiar with. Um, you select case scenarios and examples that they can relate to, as well as referring to their direct past life, their work and social experiences to help bring meaning of the learning into their world, you know, as they understand it. Next up, adult learners need multi-sensory learning experiences and teaching methodologies. And this is super important because if all you do is make videos or all you do is make ILT with participant guides, some people are going to suffer and not, you know, be in, engaged and they won't learn um, as well. And this is because, um, you know, each person has a different kind of learning style. Um, so you need to make sure that your learning interventions have appropriately proportioned delivery techniques that meet the needs of audio, visual, reading, writing, and kinesthetic dependent and independent learning preferences. If you only plan to make printed materials or only online videos, remember like some of your users will fail because those formats don't provide the sensory required for some adult learners. I've worked with several organizations who have, um, you know, put some, you know, polls together um, to actually, and there are great surveys out there like standard surveys that you can use to figure out 
which learning style um, you have, like which way you learn best with. Um, and it's actually a great idea to, to gather that information, work with your HR department to figure out um, exactly, you know, what learning styles people have so that you can um, adjust and try to make content to match the, the bulk of your audience um, in a particular topic. Adult learners are often engaged in learning because a problem needs to be solved. Practicing skills in a controlled environment allows them to grow um, in new tasks that prepare them to act autonomously outside of the learning environment. The more an adult learner can practice new skills, competencies, or the application of knowledge, the more transformational the impact and the learning intervention will have. Think about using simulation tools um, or leveraging your test or sandbox environment um, to help um, with this um, solving a problem. Give them a way to practice those skills. Um, so the, the next principle is, you know, really about um, you know, the, the desires and ambitions of your adult learners. So those intrinsic personal desires and ambitions of an adult learner need to be considered when planning and delivering your adult learning programs. As learners get older, their cause for participation in le learning programs often move from external drivers, such as getting a promotion, to internal drivers, like simply learning out of pure pleasure or interest in learning something new. I know this is true for myself. Um, you know, when I was younger, I wanted, I, I had external drivers, such as a job title or a promotion. And now I like to learn just because I find it interesting. And uh, up next is the um, effective um, programs will consider your feedback and consultation. So um, effective adult learning programs have planned for learner feedback and consultation throughout the process. Adults need to feel as though they have a sense of responsibility and control and decision making over their own learning. They need to be involved in the planning, the evaluation, and consultation of their own learning process to be fully on board with its successful execution. So in terms of education, this requires the flexibility of the learning situation, the learning program, and most importantly, the educator or the trainer to actively involve the participant in ways that allows them to have a degree of control over what they do, or in fact, how much they will learn. So, um, now that we've talked about the eight adult learning principles, I want to switch gears to look at how to create some content. So the first thing you'll need to decide is which training and content formats you want to produce for your project. These six formats are the most common formats, but by no means are a comprehensive list of all the types or variations of formats that can be created. You may also consider lunch and learns, user guides, standard operating procedures, task guides, and so on. Each format lends itself to different audience and has its benefits and limitations. When creating your plan, you're going to want to consider the audience, the location, the diversity requirements, language requirements, frequency at which tasks are performed, the turnover or attrition rate for a particular role, and the total volume of users to be trained in a particular topic. Each of these factors should be considered in your course, syllabus and agenda, and factor into your content development plan. In some cases, you may need to create content in more than one format to meet all the requirements of all of your users. When you need multiple formats or order artifacts for a single course, I recommend, again, tracking those separately in your plan. I won't read all of these to you, but there's some great details here about the pros and cons of each type of format and considerations that you'll want to think about. When getting started creating your library of content, you should take inventory of available assets and determine what can be reused or re-leveraged that's already available. 
For example, there are a variety of learning courses available on the Microsoft Learn site. Um, the Fast Track team has a large library of recorded Tech Talk videos that can be leveraged as well. And the Microsoft Docs site can be a great resource for information to help you create content. In addition, we have a variety of YouTube channels that you can watch short videos and conference session recordings. And we also offer a variety of in-person and virtual events such as our app in a day. Um, the links on this slide um, have some of the most recent list of trainings available. Um, and the last resources you have available to you um, are services available from partners. Um, and you can find these on AppSource by checking for consulting services and searching for training, for example. Uh, so I encourage you to check out these different uh, resources um, and see what you can reuse that's already existing out there. Another point to make too is like when you only have one or two people that need to be trained on a topic, leveraging these existing resources or outsourcing that training to an in a day course or using a third party uh, from AppSource um, are great options to help facilitate that training and keep your content development and delivery time down. Um, so my next slide is all about Bloom's taxonomy. If you're not familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, it's a set of three hierarchical models that are used to classify educational learning objectives into levels of complexity and specificity. Um, and these lists cover the learning objectives in cognitive, affective, and sensory domains. Um, and the the first level of Bloom's taxonomy is to remember. So examples of remembering um, are like memorizing a poem, recalling state capitals, you know, memorizing math formulas. Um, something that's more specific to Dynamics 365 might include listing reason codes or searching for a record um, or den identifying what statuses mean on a particular record. The second level of Bloom's taxonomy is to understand. Um, example activities of the understanding level include organizing the animal kingdom based on a given framework, illustrating the difference between a rectangle and a square, summarizing the plot of a simple story. For examples that are more specific to Dynamics 365, this might include comparing current processes to new processes, estimating the results of performing a specific action, like adding a discount to an order, or annotating notes on a record according to business policies. And the third level of Bloom's taxonomy um, is to apply. So examples of application or use a formula to solve a problem, select a design to meet a purpose, um, or reconstruct the passage of a new law through a given government system. Examples that are more specific to Dynamics 365 might include determining which action button to push when a specific situation occurs, examining the results of a report or an inquiry after an action is completed, or reenacting or completing steps in the system based on a demo or a given scenario. Many of your training objectives um, for Dynamics 365 will likely apply into this category. The fourth level is to analyze. So examples here are identify parts of a democracy, explain how the steps of a scientific process work, or identify why a machine isn't working. Examples that are specific to Dynamics 365 might include things like explaining the process for a return order, breaking down the steps required um, to process an order, organizing the results of a report based on requirements provided. The fifth level of Bloom's taxonomy is to evaluate. Um, so make a judgment regarding an ethical dilemma, interpret the significance of a given law or illustrate. Um, and the sixth, and, and that one's a little bit difficult with Dynamics 365. I'm sure that there are some examples out there, but that one's a little bit difficult. And the sixth and final level of um, Bloom's taxonomy is to create. So um, example activities at the creation level um, design a new solution to an old problem uh, that honors or acknowledges previous failures or delete 
the least useful arguments in a uh, persuasive essay or write a poem on a given theme. Again, not many um, very specific examples here that work well um, for Dynamics 365. I think the, the three that are, are most critical are remembering, understanding, applying. You'll have some with analyzing um, as well that are specific, but the, the two things that are important, always write objectives, that begin with an active measurable verb. If you don't want know what an active measurable verb is, the list that you see here on the screen is a great list. There are all sorts of resources online as well that you can search Bloom's taxonomy or search for active measurable verbs in C lists, but these are, are a great starting point. And make sure that you're selecting a verb from the proper column. If you like, if you want someone to be able to quote something or copy something or select something, um, that's a remembering. It's a memorization. If you want them to understand something, make sure that you're picking a verb from this list. And if you want them to be able to apply what they've learned in a hands-on experience, then use one of these applying verbs. So uh, we talked a little bit about a syllabus um, and I've got um, some screenshots here and I've got the actual syllabus and agenda available that will be available for downloads as well. Um, but uh, you can see a sample um, for a template course um, syllabus and agenda. Some key components that you want to make sure you include in your syllabus and agendas and I'll actually just switch over to the document um, to show this to you. It's got a table of contents, but you're going to want to make sure that you have a detailed description of the course and, you know, starts out, you know, this course in this particular format is designed to fill in the blank. Um, details about uh, who the course is and is not designed for. So, uh, you know, what that participant profile is along with those prerequisites. And you'll notice that your prerequisites might be specific to the person, but you might also have prerequisites that are specific to equipment needs as well. You'll need to think about requirements and restrictions as they relate to the training room, the online meeting software, capacity, language, accessibility, and so on. So if this course is only available in English, make sure you document that as a part of it. Uh, for longer courses, um, consider creating an agenda that outlines time uh, for each lesson, breaks, lunches, and exercises, like when you're going to perform those things. If it's a short, like, self-paced learning course, you probably don't need a detailed agenda that's by time. If we scroll down in this example, you can see at the very end, I did put a sample agenda in here. If it's a shorter course, you may not really need that. You'll also see that, um, you know, after I've got the, the basic, you know, logistics requirements and restrictions, then we kind of move into that actual outline. So we break things down into modules and lessons. Sometimes people use different terms. It doesn't really matter what you call them. Um, you know, modules and lessons or topics um, are, are all acceptable terms that you can use. And then at the end, there's a section here to kind of outline, you know, what the, the quizzes will be or what the kind of success measurement will be. Obviously, this is just a sample um, syllabus template that you can use. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, exactly like this uh, for your example, but it's a great starting point if you don't have one. All right, so kind of switching back, I want to talk a little bit more about measuring success in your training program. So there's a number of ways to measure success. You can create surveys. So you can ask about the content, ask about the format, ask about the instructor, um, ask for suggestions for improvement, what went well. But the thing that's most important if you're going to give a survey is to actually use the feedback in the survey and adjust. If you gather a bunch of feedback and you don't ever do anything about the feedback that you receive, people will become a little bit jaded, so to speak, and they probably won't give you feedback. Um, if you're going to use tests and quizzes, consider each of the objectives. So um, each test or each quiz question should map back to specific objectives. You'll also want to think about the question format. 
different question formats are easier to grade than others, but you'll also need to consider what a passing score is. So what does success look like? Um, how difficult is this test? You might want to test your test, you know, basically do a beta run of your test with some users as well to kind of determine how difficult is this test and what is a passing score? Um, you'll want to analyze results individually and overall. If everyone got question three wrong, then you probably didn't train very well on that content or you didn't ask the question very well and consider, you know, am I really going to dock everyone on question three because they didn't get the question right? Or do I need to adjust my content or adjust the way I ask that question? Um, consider who will be grading and how you're going to be grading. Um, and again, use the results and adjust. If you found that question three was really unclear, you either need to adjust your content or you need to adjust your quiz or your test question. Um, and shadowing is another great way. So pair strong resources with newer or weaker resources, someone who's struggling. Um, using the see one, do one, teach one approach is another great technique that you can use um, from an exercise and shadowing uh, perspective. Also think about what tasks must be completed and what checkpoints are critical along the way in a particular process that you can ask the user about um, or get them to pause and talk about. And make sure that you're defining success criteria for each task. Again, use your results and adjust. If you don't use the uh, results and adjust, then you're, you know, you might be missing out on, you know, people actually learning what you needed them to learn. So when you're creating engaging, uh, well, when you're creating video or self-paced content, um, there's a number of things that you're going to want to consider. Um, you need to know your audience. So what questions or topics do they really want to see? With videos, you can't tell if your audience is falling asleep on the other side. So check for likes, comments, and retention rates of them staying on the video. You want to make sure that you're clear. No mumbling, no talking too fast, you know, validate your audio levels and be confident when recording. Um, cl a clear line from point A to point B in your video will be helpful as well. Um, and using numbered lists in videos um, can be uh, a very helpful way to get a point across. Um, include a promise with a, a benefit, right? So what will they gain? Um, and give a promise of how that benefit, um, you know, will be, uh, how that promise will benefit the viewer personally. Have energy. Talk with lots of energy. If you do a video and you talk like this the entire time, nobody's going to want to listen to it. Trust me, it's true. So don't talk in your normal voice. Be passionate. Energy is contagious. Uh, storytelling is another great aspect. So if you're telling a story, your viewer will want to hear the end. So think of examples your audience can relate to. Um, and use true stories. Don't just make up stuff that doesn't actually exist. Um, have a conversation with your audience. Don't talk at your audience. Talk with your audience and use a two-way dialogue and answer questions or respond to comments. So you can actually have a two-way dialogue with two people in a video um, as well. And open and close loops. So start talking about an idea or a story, but leave the idea or story to be finished later in the video. So you can start an exciting story. So the example is like John from the warehouse timed how long it took to pick an item with the old system and the new system. Want to know how much time he saves with the new system? We'll get to that in a minute. But first, let's talk about three easy clicks to perform a pick in the new system. Um, planning ahead. Content must be concise and to the point. Make sure to create a video script so you're not rambling on and on. So the next slide is really about your written content. So when you're writing um, documentation, it's important that you write technically accurate documentation. Technical documentation can quickly go from here's how to use this and if you're unfamiliar and have limited experience to here's an unedited transcript of everything our developer told us about this obscure application of our API. One's going to get you using the product right away while the other will make you go cross-eyed. So research and plan. Write what you know, audit what you have and what is missing, use style guides, um, create an outline, 
think about the tools and the management that you have available and your deadlines and deliverable. Then you're going to structure and design your content. Use simple templates or schemas and create simple logical flow. Um, an example like uh, title, what is it? Subtitle, additional information, overview, what you will learn, a table of contents, internal navigation, features, each section of the document, and what to read next, related documents that might help the user. Then you can start creating your content. Make sure to start with a draft. Write like a human. The golden commandment of technical writing is thou shalt not assume. Write as much as needed to be helpful and not a word more. Um, and remember to use visuals. So include screenshots, include process flows. Don't just include words. Sometimes a picture can do a lot more than three paragraphs of text. Use the 30-90 rule. So what this means is that 30% done, uh, your first draft or outline, you're not asking for in-depth feedback or reviewing typos and grammar, but rather for the reviewer to engage the broader outline, the flow, and the structure of the document. While at 90% done, your final draft, you're asking them to go over the documentation with a fine-tuned comb and nitpick any issues. Have peer reviews and edit, edit, edit. Like you can't ever edit too much. Then you want to make sure you review and test. Test all the links. Test your step-by-steps. Check for usability and the navigation of your document or your video. And then your maintenance and updates. Make sure that your technical documentation has some sort of maintenance cycle and that you're continuing to update it. So remember, use screenshots, write step-by-steps, bold your UI elements, use accurate UI names, don't use slang or jargon, always start and end from the main menu, and make sure to include scenarios or stories. Things not to do, don't screenshot every step. If you felt like you needed to screenshot every single step and just, you know, a vomit of screenshots, it's probably not the right format to make a written document. You might want to consider making a short video of those steps. Don't write incomplete steps and don't use jargon or nicknames for UI elements. And don't publish your training content or your courses without first going through a testing process. Don't start in the middle of a process and don't assume your users already know. So I've put up an example here of well-written step-by-steps and a poor example. So on the left-hand side, you can see we start with the scenario. Um, we're saying go to general ledger, currencies, exchange rate types, and each UI element, everything that you're going to click on in the system is bolded. So general ledger is the name of the modules, currencies is the name of the folder, exchange rates type is the name of the link or the page that you're going to click on. In step two, we say select new or click new. You can see it's bolded because that's a UI element they are going to click on. In the step three, we can see in the exchange rate type field, so that's the field they're going to be clicking in, type, you know, some sort of value. Um, in the poor example on the right hand side, you can see we didn't start with a scenario. There's no bolding. Uh, there's no navigation from the main menu. I'm just supposed to know how to get to the exchange rates type page. Um, and we've also like you can see too that they've combined multiple steps together. Generally, like each separate click or each separate page should be its own step. Don't try to make big exhaustive three sentence long steps. Those are much harder to follow. When you look at the good example, um, I don't necessarily, especially if I'm referring back to these step by steps later after I've already like done it the first time. The first time I probably read all the words in here. The second time I can just look at my bold steps and remember, oh, that's where I need to click. And I don't need to, to read the whole entire step or the whole entire sentence. And make sure that you give them closing instructions. If you don't, a lot of times people don't realize they're supposed to close the, the, the page and, and they won't know how to start the next step. So make sure that when you're done, we show them, okay, we're done now, you can close that page. All right. So, um, other content considerations, we talked a little bit about this earlier, is languages. So, you make sure you're creating a list of languages to, to support. Um, also, consider if English, like, so if your content is going to be written in English, um, 
is English a second language for any of your participants? If your primary language that you're writing your content in is German and you also need to make some content in French um, or some of your audience is German is not their first language, consider that um, in the way that you write your content um, because Anytime a language is not your primary language, um, a second language are typically a little bit more difficult for a person and their reading level tends to be a little bit lower than their first language. So you may need to adjust the language um, reading level of your content to be lower to support readability by your entire audience. Also make sure that you consider accessibility. For color blindness, make sure you're looking at color contrast, text descriptions instead of color descriptions. For people that are hard of seeing, make sure you consider font sizes, image sizes, make sure that you're using alternative um, text for all of your images, um, screen readers, immersive readers, and so on. For the hard of hearing, if you're making videos, make sure you've got closed captioning. If you're doing instructor-led classes, um, do you need to bring in sign language interpreters or have scripts? Um, and then physical constraints. Uh, do some people have device limitations or capabilities that they won't be able to use certain types of devices? There is an accessibility checker that is built in to uh, Dynamics 365, or not Dynamics, Office 365 products, so PowerPoint, Word, etc., all have this. It's on the review tab in the action pane, just like you do a, um, uh, just like you do a um, spell check, you can do an accessibility check and it'll check for a lot of these things for you and give you guidance on how to correct or make improvements to your document. I always recommend running that accessibility checker on all of your documents. Um, and so the last slide to talk about here is the review process for your training content. So um, you need to think about who your reviewers are. So SMEs and editors early, that 3090 concept that we talked about, so early reviews and late reviews, the types of content. Um, if someone's reviewing a video, like they're going to be watching a video and giving either verbal or written feedback to someone. If we're reviewing a Word document or a PowerPoint, I might be using the comments feature or striking through. Um, and make sure that you create a checklist for your reviews. So all the things that you want your reviewers to be checking for um, as well you know, like technical accuracy, spelling, grammar, etc. That way they remember that these are all the things I need to check for. When you're testing your content, um, you're going to want to include um, testing of all of your step-by-step -step, um, screen readers and your alternative text. Is your closed captioning accurate? Um, a lot of times we might auto-generate those, but you need to review it because they're not perfect. And then obviously making sure that you're getting speller and grammar type things updated. And for the cycles, um, you need to review your outlines in your system, uh, your syllabus and agenda. Make sure you've got a good structure, a good plan in place before you start putting pen to paper. Um, that rough draft, that 30 and the final draft at the 90. And then you need a maintenance cycle as well. So you're going to keep updating that content as you take updates to the system or your business processes change. So what does that maintenance cycle look like? So that wraps us up for today. As a side note, um, I would have liked to show a demo of the task recorder today, but we didn't have enough time in my content. So I will be sharing a, a video demonstration of how to use the task recorder in Dynamics 365 to get your step-by-steps and export those to Word documents. So there will be a video included along with the PowerPoint and the final uh, video presentation of this that I'll encourage you all to, to review and watch. Um, but just due to time, we couldn't fit it in today's session. So that'll be available as a separate uh, resource that you can download. Uh, but we'll open it up for questions um, at this point. I see that we had quite a few come in. I don't know, Dan, did we have any uh, questions that you think we should um, talk about? Uh, no, I've got uh, all, the, um, all the questions answered so far, Rachel. OK. Oh, there I do was see one, one there was sorry there was one request to publish an example of a of a glossary with term changes so um i suggested you, you'll just publish an example with the rest of the the templates 
Sure. Um, we can definitely look at trying to publish a sample glossary of terms. I, and I think that's a key one for a lot of, of users. Obviously, the terms that are specific to your organization might be different, but I can certainly make a template and put a few examples in there that I've seen from uh, my past experiences. But your old system um, in the terminology and jargon that you use in your business uh, will be different, uh, but I can certainly try to put a quick example and template together. So that's a great suggestion. Um, I think this uh, the question that came in from Chris R um, and Dan, your answer, I think these are great resources. If you didn't see them in the Q&A, um, so Chris asked, do you have examples of best practices and guides for using task guides within FNO? Um, so, and, and Dan responded, and thank you, Dan, for, for um, responding to that. But there's two great links in there that I think are worth sharing. But the regression suite automation tool is one that is available. Um, and then configuring the help experience inside of finance and operations. And there's two links in there. So uh, those are great resources that I, I would strongly suggest you look into and use. And in my demo video, um, I'll actually show and, and talk through, um, you'll be able to see that actually like how to record one and, and some best practices. Um, some basics just verbally for you. Always start at the main menu and end at the main menu, like on the home page. Don't start in the middle of a process um, for a user that you're going to use for like work instructions. But if you're using it for test automation, that rule is different. Um, um, using and adding screenshots. So there's a keyboard shortcut you can use. I don't recall it off the top of my head, but I do it in the demo to show you how to add additional keyboard shortcuts and then exporting those as Word documents or saving those into your business process model or library. Um, I strongly suggest saving them into the BPM because um, that makes them available online for other users. But if you're trying to make a participant guide or exercise files of, you know, step by steps that people are going to do in a specific exercising class, export it as a Word document because then you can go put that into, uh, you know, the rest of your content, um, you know, without having to write those step by steps. And honestly, I, I think using the task recorder to record your step by steps in general, uh, it takes all the guesswork out of it because it will automatically bold and do all of those clicks for you, but you will want to consider adding those additional details um, onto certain steps. So that looks like all of the questions that we had for today. Um, so thank you everyone for joining with that. I'm going to hand it back over to Nina to, to wrap us up today. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, so it looks like Nina might be having some audio troubles. So a panel. There we go. Oh, did you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you now. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, great. Yeah. So I wanted I wanted to just make a plug for our for our um, survey that we'd like to get your feedback on on today's session. Uh, the survey scores are on a scale from one to five, with five being the highest score possible. Thank you for your participation in that. And as a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter Rachel, and thank you to our audience for logging in and joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.